Okay, hello, hello. My name is Karthik. I'll be with you this beautiful Thursday evening for Real Estate Principles Chapter 15. Want to take a moment and welcome you to the call today. It is an absolute pleasure to have you. The schedule today, again, is calling for Chapter 15 today. And chronologically, this is the last chapter in the book. Uh, so remember, if you're a guest today, you can sign up right on the website. It'll take you, you know, three months, four months, depending on state processing time from the date you start to get your license, if you kind of hustle through it. So if you decide you'd like to enroll, we'd love to have you and we can ship you the books ASAP. So if you look here, let me show you something on pages 440 and 441. There's some key words here on 440 and 441 that we do need to know is you'll see the term police power on page 440. Now, police power is the power of the government to enact laws to promote three things. Those three things are public health, public safety, and general welfare. And you might wanna write that down somewhere in your notes if you're a guest, but if you're, uh, if you're already enrolled, as most of you are, you might wanna write this on 440 on the left. Police power is the power of the government to enact laws to promote three things. Those three things are public health, public safety, and general welfare. So police power doesn't have anything to do with the actual cops. Police power doesn't have to do with the police. It has to do with the right of the government to pass laws to promote three things. Those three things are public health, public safety, and general welfare. And the truth is, most of our laws come from police power. The fact that we have speed limits is an exercise of police power. We have speed limits so that you know people aren't going 100 miles an hour on the freeway or 60 miles an hour in a neighborhood. So the fact that we have zoning laws, we don't want a nuclear dump right across the street from a kindergarten. That's supposed to benefit public health, safety, and welfare. So be careful on the test. If the test were to say, the supreme power of the government to enact laws to promote public health, public safety, and general welfare is known as what again? That's police power. And that's a bedrock of basically every law that we have. Now, one thing the government also has the right to do, because this whole chapter is about government rights and real estate, if you look at the bottom left on 440, you'll see the term eminent domain at the bottom left of 440. Now, eminent domain, this is super important for the test, you might have heard of this before. If the government wants to widen a street and your house happens to be in the way, the government has this crazy authority literally to take your house to build the freeway. That right of the government to take your house and put a freeway on top of it or widen the street is called eminent domain. If the government needed to build a school and your building happened to be in the way, the government has the right to take your building to build the school. The power that the government has to do that is known as eminent domain. Now, you might want to write the word power next to eminent domain at the bottom of 440, because that's going to be an important distinction. Eminent domain is the authority or power of the government to take private property for some public use. Now, they're not just going to steal it from you. They have to pay you for it. The process where the government cuts you a check and tells you to leave, that process is known as condemnation. And you'll see this term condemnation at the bottom of 440 on the left, right near eminent domain. Condemnation is where the government cuts you a check and tells you to leave. So the process whereby the government takes a property is condemnation. The power that they had to do that is known as eminent domain. So be careful on the test. If the test were to say the supreme power of the government to take private property for some public use is known as eminent domain, the process whereby eminent domain is exercised, that process is known as condemnation. And by the way, right next to condemnation, you might want to write the words government forces sale. The government forces the sale through condemnation. They're going to pay you for it. Now, interestingly, the opposite is also possible. In fact, if you look at page 441, if you look on the right there, the middle of 441, 
you'll see the term inverse condemnation. So inverse condemnation, inverse condemnation is backwards. Condemnation is the government forcing you to sell. Inverse condemnation is where you force the government to buy your property. The landowner forces the government to buy the property. Now, let's be honest. What's going to be easier, the government forcing you to sell or you forcing them to buy? What's going to be easier? Well, obviously, the government forcing you to sell is going to be a million times easier. The only way inverse condemnation works, the only way you can actually force the government to buy your property is if something that the government did nearby makes it impossible for you to enjoy the property. Now, the most common example of this for the test is an example about an airport. You might see a question on the exam that says, a property owner lives near a small municipal airport. Over time, the airport gets so big, loud, and noisy that the property owner can no longer enjoy their property. You know, planes land every six minutes, the house shakes, the, you know, the drywall's coming undone, the house is you know, basically rocking back and forth every six minutes. Okay, you could force the government to buy your property now based on inverse condemnation. So really, we have four terms for the test. Number one, the supreme power of the government to enact laws to promote public health, public safety, and general welfare. That's police power, number one. Number two, the power of the government to take private property for some public use to build a school, to widen a street, to build a freeway, the power is eminent domain. The process whereby eminent domain is exercised, where the government cuts you a check and forces you to sell it to them, the building's been condemned. That's called condemnation. And finally, anytime the government puts nearby land to a use that affects your ability to reasonably enjoy the property, you may have a claim based on inverse condemnation, right? The, an airport's right by your house. Your house shakes every two minutes. Okay, the government might be forced to buy that property through inverse condemnation. Now, I want to share one thing with you here. If you look at page number 442 at the top, you'll see this gray box at the top of 442 that says the general plan on 442. Now, I want to be careful for the test this term general plan for the state exam might also be called the master plan. So general plan and master plan really mean the same thing. Every city and county is required by law to have a long range plan for development within that city. Every city and county is required to have a plan as to how that city is going to develop. And I want to give you a couple of examples of this. If you look at, I mean, and think about, if you look at this gray box on 442, you'll see things that are inside of the general plan. What are things that the general plan would cover? Well, one thing the general plan might cover is building height, how high you can build a property, uh, density, how close you can put property to one another, land use in general what you can and can't do on the land. So every city, and this if you look at most cities and you drive through them, cities don't develop by accident. Every city is required to have a long range plan called the general plan or master plan that dictates how that city is going to develop in the future. I'll give you an example. Think about the city of industry. Now, if you're not from Southern California, the city of industry is a, is a pretty large city about uh, 17 miles east of downtown LA. Now, the name city of industry should give you a clue as to what that city is like. There's a lot of warehouses. There's a lot of distribution. There's a lot of um, uh, industrial. There's office. There aren't a lot of people, despite the fact that the city of industry is a pretty, physically, it's a large city. You don't have a lot of people that live in the city of industry. Why? Because the city of industry has a general plan that isn't really about, you know, wide open spaces and housing and, you know, low density housing. It's not that way. So if I owned 50 acres in industry 
and I wanted to build a couple of hundred houses on my 50 acres, that's not going to be easy because that land use of residential is not consistent with the general plan. So the general plan basically is a long range plan to decide how the city is going to develop. And you'll see this on 442. Now, what does it cover? It covers land use, open space. It covers housing. It covers you know how high you can build a property. Think about the beach. The houses in most beach communities are you know six feet from one another. You can reach out and touch the neighbor next to you. That's very high density housing. You have houses that are you know right on top of one another. Now, if you're a builder and you have some land in the suburbs, and in the suburbs you wanted to build housing that close to one another you might not be able to get map and plan approval to build housing that close to each other. Why? Because high density housing in most suburban areas is not consistent with the master plan. So two questions for the test. Number one, a comprehensive long range plan for development could best be described as what again? The general plan or the master plan, number one. Number two, what is the tool we use to implement the general plan, the tool is zoning. In fact, you might want to write that down on 442. Zoning is the tool that is used to execute the general plan. Cool. So the city of industry, the general plan wants a bunch of industrial and retail and distribution and warehouse is fine. So all the land is going to be zoned according to that land use that's consistent with the general plan. Now, I want to share one more thing with you just real quick on 443. I don't have this in my slide, but I do just because we have a little bit of time. I want to share something with you. If you look at the middle of 443 on the right, you'll see this paragraph that says the specific plan. So we have two plans, right? With the general plan, which is the macro sort of outlook for the entire city or county. That's the general plan. Then you have a specific plan also. The specific, I'll give you an example of this. There's a uh, I'm not in our office every day, but uh, we have one of our offices is in Rancho Cucamonga, which if you're not from Southern California, it's about 40 miles east of downtown LA. And there's a city right next to Rancho Cucamonga called Upland. And Upland has an, a pretty cool downtown area. There's you know a bunch of shopping and stuff. But for some reason, and I don't know why this happened, but for some reason in that downtown area of Upland, there are a ton of barber shops, a ton of barber shops. There's at least you know ten barber shops in downtown Upland. Downtown Upland has something in their specific plan saying that for that downtown district, Upland is not going to allow barber shops in downtown Upland anymore. There's way too many of them. There's way too many of them. They're not going to permit barber shops anymore in downtown upland now you can open a new barber shop in upland you just can't open a new barber shop in downtown upland because it's the specific plan has a rule banning new barber shops in downtown upland because there's too many of them so you'll have a general plan for the entire city and then you may have a specific plan that is as the name implies specific to a particular area in that city but at the end of the day all this is about zoning and if you look at 443 and 444, at the bottom of 443, you'll see the term zoning. And by the way, right next to the zoning, I would write the words exercise of police power. Zoning is an exercise of police power. Now, we talked about police power already. Police power is, again, the supreme power of the government to pass laws to promote three things. Those three things are public health, public safety, and general welfare. So zoning is an exercise of police power. Again, we don't want a nuclear dump right next to a kindergarten. We don't want a bar right next door to a high school, right, serving alcohol and liquor at all hours of the day and night. So zoning is, again, an exercise of police power. Now, what does zoning cover? Zoning covers permitted uses, what you can and can't do in the area. Zoning covers minimum parcel size, meaning how big do parcels have to be? They 
cover setbacks. How close can houses build, be built to one another? That's also building density, right? How much open space do you need between the structure and the property line? So zoning covers all of these things at the bottom of 443. Now, again, this is reflective of what? The general plan. Because the general plan is that comprehensive, long-range plan for development within an area. That is what the general plan is. And how is it executed? It's executed based on zoning. Now, if you look at 444, I want to show you one thing on 444. You'll see a couple things. First, you'll see on 444 at the very top, you'll see the term conditional use permit at the very top of 444. And you'll see the term zoning variance kind of into the middle of 444. So we have two ways to potentially change the zoning in an area. One of those is called a conditional use permit, and another one is called a zoning variance. Now, I want to share uh, both of these with you uh, right now and what the differences are. So the first thing you might want to write on page 444 is I'd look at the term conditional use permit, and then I would write the words requested by tenant. Conditional use permits are most often initiated by commercial tenants. Now, let me give you an example of a conditional use permit that's worth noting for the exam. So check this out. Uh, let's say that I own an eight-story office building down in uh, Santa Ana. And I have a uh, space that's empty on the third floor of my office building. Now, I have a guy or gal that wants to rent this empty space on the third floor. And he is an ophthalmologist that does uh, LASIK procedures, you know, the, the eye operation or whatever. And my building is zoned office. This gentleman or uh, lady wants to do LASIK eye surgery in my office building. Now, the building is not zoned medical office. The tenant may need to get something called a conditional use permit for the city to allow them to conduct eye operations in an office building. Now, there may be conditions, hence the term conditional use permit, there may be conditions attached to that ophthalmologist getting approval to do medical procedures in an office building. Here's a condition. City may say, fine, we'll give you a conditional use permit, but you need backup generator power, or you need you know, big batteries in case the power goes out in the building and you're in the middle of an operation. We wanna make sure that there's no risk of harm to the patient. So one of the conditions is that you have you know, backup power, I'll make something up. There may be another condition where you know, there has to be like reserved parking out front for Folks, after they finish their laser procedures, you know, they have, they don't have to walk clear across the parking lot. So you might need four reserve parking spots. I'm making something up. I don't know. But the point is, is that conditional use permits, I don't want to change the whole zoning on my building. I want it to be an office building. So as the owner, I don't want to change anything. My commercial tenant wants to change what is permitted to be done in that building. So the tenant goes to the city and applies for a CUP. Uh, for their business in my office building. Now, the variance is different. You'll see this on 444. The variance is a change to the zoning that might be requested by the owner. For example, the book has an example about a deck where somebody has a house. The house is in an area where the house doesn't have a deck. It's not permitted. And every other house has a deck. The owner wants permission from the city to build a deck. Great, so they get a zoning variance. The city allows a deck to be built. Maybe if I'm a commercial landlord, I want a you know fifth story built. Somehow the general plan only allows four stories. Okay, I'll ask for a zoning variance to allow a fifth level to be built or something like that. So generally the person initiating the variance is gonna be the owner. The person initiating the CUP is often going to be a commercial tenant asking for that particular use to be allowed. Now, I do want to pause here for a second. Uh, check the chat here real quick. Uh, in, the, in the chat, someone says, do we have access to the city's master plan for future development? Yeah, so the master plan is 
uh, very easy to obtain. For example, I'll, I'll post one here uh, for the city of Irvine as an example. I'll post that in the group chat. That's a link to the city of Irvine's general plan. So, uh, but yeah, the, the general plan is quite easy. It's quite easy to access. I do want to unmute the room here real quick and see if there's any other questions that I can answer. Okay, well, I want to respect your time. We do end on time as always. So uh, I'll jump right back into the deck here. And I do want to talk for a quick second about zoning codes on 445 through 446. And apologies, especially if you're a guest today. I know you don't yet have your books, but if you look at 445 and 446, what you'll notice is that there's a ton of zoning codes. And this is a sample of zoning codes for the city of Los Angeles. You don't need to know all of these, but I do want to share a couple of things with you. The first thing I want to share is that uh, in every city, these zoning codes are going to mean something a little different. So just because R3 might mean something in Los Angeles, it doesn't mean that R3 means the exact same thing in San Francisco, as an example. So it's very important that we understand that all real estate is local. All these zoning codes don't mean the same thing in every instance. So bear that in mind. Now, I do want to show you one more thing. I want to show you, I want to talk about the M zoning codes to illustrate a point. So if you look here at the bottom of 445, you'll notice that we have an M1 code for the city of LA. The M1 code at the bottom of 445 says limited industrial. The M3 code right below that says heavy industrial. So I want to I want to show you two things here. So first, just as a premise, M1 says limited industrial. In your own mind, if you just close your eyes and picture a limited industrial zone. Now, what that actually means. So to me, if I picture limited or light industrial, I might picture, you know, some small warehouses, maybe you have, you know, a small little distribution center, maybe somebody's storing something. It's not really that dirty. If I want to picture heavy industrial, to me, heavy industrial, I if I were to picture it just in my own mind, I picture a bunch of like cement trucks and dirt and rocks and gravel and you know, heavy industrial just seems dirtier. So question for you, if you have a business, I know this is going to sound horrible, just, just bear with me though. But if you had a business and you wanted to pollute more, would you need an M1 or would you need an M3 zone? Well, if you wanted to pollute more, you would probably need an M3 zone. You would need heavy industrial if you wanted to pollute more. So notice one thing here, the alphanumeric zoning code like that M refers to manufacturing or industrial. The number does not refer to the number of units. Like M3, for example, does not mean three warehouses. M1 doesn't mean one warehouse the number refers to the level of restriction on the lot. Notice, and I put this in the slide here, notice that the higher the number is, the fewer the restrictions. The higher the number, the fewer the restrictions. M3, go ahead, pollute all you want. Within reason, you get what I'm saying. The higher that number, there's less rules. The lower that number, the more restrictions we have. So again, true or false, the alphanumeric zoning designation refers to the number of structures that could be built. False. That number doesn't mean the number of buildings. The number refers to the level of restriction on the lot. I'll, I'll give you a quick example of this. I had a building near, uh, it's a 25,000 square foot building, uh, 12,000 square feet of that was occupied by Trader Joe's as the commercial tenant. And right next door to that was uh, some empty space, a large empty box. Zone C2 in a particular city. So it's commercial and the number was two. Someone came to me because they wanted to rent the 12,000 feet or whatever that was next door. This person comes to me with a business uh, that does three things. 
they're a pet business. One part of their business is they sell pet supplies like leashes, collars, dog food, like a retail uh, pet store. That's one way they make money. Another way they make money is through pet grooming. So people bring their dogs for grooming. The third way they make money is through pet boarding, where you know if somebody's going away for three or four days, um, they uh, they can leave their pet with uh, with this business. Now the zoning is C two. Interestingly, C two in that city allows pet stores, it allows pet grooming, it allows pet boarding, but it doesn't allow pet boarding for more than one day. You can't have overnight pet boarding in a C2 zone in the in this city that I'm referring to. That deal fell apart. We weren't able to lease to that person because we they couldn't get a conditional use permit, A. And B, they couldn't give up the overnight boarding. It was a pretty profitable part of their business. So you needed C3 to board a pet overnight, not C2. So if you want fewer rules that zoning code has to be higher. In the case of industrial, if you want to pollute more, you need M3, not M1. In the case of residential, if you want to build more units, you need R4, not R2. So the number, again, I want to be very clear, has nothing to do with the number of structures. It refers to the level of restriction on the lot. So hopefully you wrote higher number, fewer restrictions, somewhere in your notes on page 445. Now, sometimes you might drive past an area and you see, for example, maybe an adult entertainment facility or uh, uh, some other type of business that has been there so long, even though you couldn't get zoning approval for that now, but it's been there so long, you can probably guess what this is, it's been grandfathered in. So you may want to write somewhere in your notes because it's on the test, but not in the book, somewhere on 445 or 446, you might want to write the words grandfather clause. So the grandfather clause is a clause in the zoning that allows an older use to continue. A clause in the zoning that allows an older use to continue is known as a grandfather clause. It allows an existing use to continue even though that use might be considered non-conforming. It allows an existing use to continue even though it might now be considered non-conforming. What are examples of this? Maybe churches in residential zones. Maybe there's a church that's been there since 1915 and it's in a, around a bunch of houses. The church gets to stay because it's what? It's been grandfathered in, for example. So if the question on the test were to say, a clause in a zoning provision that allows an existing use to continue, although now non-conforming could best be described as what again? A grandfather clause, right? A grandfather clause. Now, one more thing I want to share with you. If you look at 440, uh, 447, uh, I want to talk for a quick second at the middle of 447 about subdivisions. And you might say to yourself, well, what is a subdivision? A subdivision is exactly what it sounds like. You're starting with one large parcel, and then you're cutting that large parcel up into smaller pieces. So you're subdividing, right? You start with a large parcel and you're cutting that large parcel into smaller pieces. Now, you just can't randomly do that. As a developer, you can't just randomly take a lot and cut it. You have to follow at least one of two laws. And those two laws, if you look at the middle of page 447, you'll see the term subdivided lands law in these two black squares or subdivision map act. So these are the two laws that we need to know about subdividing. One, of course, is the lands law. Another is the MAP Act. Now, here's the easy way to remember this. So the lands law, look at lands, L-A-N-D-S, five letters. Anytime you cut a property up into five or more parcels, you have to follow the lands law. So right next to Land's Law at the middle of 447, you might want to write the number five and then a plus sign. So if you're cutting a piece of real estate into five or more parcels, you're subject to the subdivided Land's Law. If you're cutting it into two or more parcels, you have to follow something called the Subdivision Map Act. 
And if you look at MAP, think about this for a second. MAP, it's just a shorter word. Two to four parcels, you're subject to the MAP Act. Five or more parcels, you're subject to the lands law. Now, if the question on the test were to say, the procedure for filing a subdivision plan where a property is divided into five or more parcels could be found where? The lands law. Two or more parcels can be found where? The subdivision map act. Excellent, subdivision map act. Now, if you're going to subdivide, I wanna share something with you. If you're going to subdivide, you have to, there's one of three subdivisions you can create. And I wanna save you some reading here. If you look at 448 at the top, you'll see the term types of subdivisions at the top of 448. And there are three types of subdivisions we should know for the test. First, there's a standard subdivision. There's a common interest subdivision. And then there's something called an undivided interest subdivision. So these are the three types of subdivisions that we need to know for the test. A standard subdivision, a common interest subdivision, and then an undivided interest subdivision. Now, let me explain the difference between each of these. So first, we'll start with the term standard subdivision. First, next to this, I would write three words. I'd write the words no common area. A standard subdivision has no common area. Now, your house is probably in a standard subdivision, meaning with you, think about your home. Your home, you do not share a pool with your neighbor, most likely. You don't share a yard with your neighbor. There are no common areas between you and your neighbor in a regular suburban home. You live in a standard subdivision. You could also have what's called a common interest subdivision. Now, this would be a condo. A condominium is an example of a common interest subdivision. Now, why is a condo a common interest subdivision? Because in a condo, you actually do own in common some portion of that common area with your neighbor. For example, if you live in a condo that has 80 units, you own 180th of the pool. You own 180th of the green belt and the garage and the common gym and all that. So that's a condo. You have something in common that you own with your neighbor. We have something called an undivided interest subdivision. In an undivided interest subdivision, this is where you have, imagine you have a 10 acre piece of real estate and you have about a hundred members in your church. The hundred members in the church decide they're gonna pool their money together and they're gonna buy this hundred acre parcel or 50 acre parcel for the church. Now, we're gonna, we're gonna have one property and we don't wanna physically divide it. We just wanna divide up the owners. In an undivided interest subdivision, you have one lot and you have many owners. In a standard subdivision, you have many lots and many owners. In a common interest subdivision, you have some portion of the common area that you own with your neighbor, like you know, pool, spa, green belt, garage, gym, you know, uh, the land itself even in a condo. So these are the three types of subdivisions. There's a standard subdivision, there is a uh, common interest subdivision, and there is an undivided interest subdivision. So these are the three types of subdivisions that exist. Now watch, if you're chopping a property into five or more parcels, what do you have to follow? The land's law. Two or more parcels, what do you have to follow? The MAP Act, right, the MAP Act. Now I wanna show you one more thing here real quick. Uh, on 447, just kind of a review of what we've talked about already. The MAP Act is for two, three, or four units. The lands law, you'll see this chart on 447, is for five or more units. Now, I do want to pause here for a quick second uh, and see uh, if there are any questions. So let's jump right back into the uh, into the deck here. Uh, I also want to talk for a quick second on page 454. If you come forward uh, to 454, uh, two things I want to discuss with you. The first is on 454, you'll see the term EIR. And an EIR stands for an environmental impact report. 
And the environmental impact report is part of the development process. So you're gonna need, before you can build, you're going to need an environmental impact report that will basically determine the impact of the proposed project on the environment. So you'll see this term on 454, uh, environmental impact report. This is a report done by an environmental company that basically assesses the impact of the development on the environment. So just as an example, uh, if you're gonna build in an area before you can get map and plan approval, the environmental company will say, hey, are there any endangered animals there? What's gonna be the impact of this project on the flora or the fauna, or how many trees are we gonna to have to tear down in order to, in order to build these homes or build this building? It's not just for uh, things like trees and animals, but they were thinking for a while before they built the SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, there was a proposal to build another stadium called Farmer's Field, Farmers for the Insurance Company in downtown LA. The city had an environmental impact report done. Now there are no endangered toads in downtown LA, but there was probably gonna be a pretty significant environmental impact building a 55,000 seat stadium in downtown LA. Now this was supposed to be half of the convention center was gonna be torn down for this. Obviously that didn't happen, but you're welcome to research it. But we needed an environmental impact report to see, hey, what's gonna to happen to the pollution? What's gonna to happen to traffic congestion? What's gonna to happen to the homelessness population in uh, downtown? So the goal is something called a negative declaration. So I know that sounds bad at the top of 454, but it's actually good. A negative declaration is a statement at the end of the EIR that basically says, hey, the impact on the environment is negligible and we don't expect there to be uh, any problems here or certainly not enough to stop the development. So the goal, if you're trying to get your project greenlit, the goal is a negative declaration saying, hey, again, the impact on the environment is not significant enough to stop the development. So that's the EIR. Now, so again, a negative declaration says the impact on the environment is acceptable. Now, another thing you might wanna look at on 454 at the middle, you'll see the term Alquist Priolo at the middle of 454. Very important to remember that Alquist Priolo refers to earthquakes. So if the question on the test were to say, between earthquakes, fires, tornadoes, or floods, the Alquis Priolo Special Studies Act covers development and disclosure in what hazard area? Earthquakes. So again, Alquis Priolo goes with earthquakes. So again, you're an expert now on government control of real estate. You know about eminent domain. You know about condemnation. You know about inverse condemnation. You know about the general plan and zoning. You know about subdivisions. One thing that we do need to talk about though as it relates to the government with my last 15 minutes with you is on 456. Very important on 456. You'll see at the very top of the page, fair housing. Now, the question about fair housing is twofold. And think about this for a second for the test. Question one is, is the goal of fair housing, do you think the goal of fair housing is to make sure that everybody pays the same rate and term on their loan? Is the goal of fair housing to make sure everybody pays the same rate? No, the goal is not to make sure that everybody pays the same rate because frankly, if you have good credit and I have bad credit, whether or not I'm a minority or whether or not I have kids or whatever my religion happens to be, doesn't matter, right? The goal is not to make sure that everyone pays the same rate because not everybody should pay the same rate. Somebody with good credit should not be paying the same rate as somebody with poor credit, fine. So that might be tempting, but that's not the goal. Is the goal of fair housing to make sure that banks make an equal amount of loans to members of every race? No. 
That would be horrible. Two problems with that. Number one, there aren't the same amount of every race in existence, number one. Number two, how horrible would that be if you tried to get a loan and Wells Fargo told you, no, 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 we can't make you a loan. You happen to be blue. We made way too many loans to blue people this month. We need more green people. Come back next month when the quota resets. That's not how we want it to go. Instead of any of those two incorrect things, the goal of fair housing really, and you might want to write this down at the top of 456, because this is how it's framed on the test. The goal is to make our industry colorblind. Now, what does colorblind mean? Colorblind means that we're, you're not going to take into account someone's race, religion, gender, familial status, any of these protected classes in making a lending decision or making a real estate decision. So again, the goal is to make our industry colorblind, where we don't take into account any of these protected classes, number one. Number two, I want to share one thing with you on 456. See at the top of 456 on the left where it says discrimination in housing? Now, you'll see a, a, a sentence there that says real estate brokers in italics. It's kind of the second line at the top of 456 in that discrimination in housing paragraph. You might want to highlight that sentence. It says real estate brokers should not accept the listing of any property where such discrimination is attempted. Real estate brokers should not accept the listing where such discrimination is attempted. Let me, let, me, let me frame this up for the test. So the exam might give you a, a question, a story question. The state exam is famous for, you know, not just asking you one sentence questions, but giving you, you know, a scenario or a story over a paragraph and wanting you to figure out what's what. So here's the question you might find on the test. It says, a real estate broker is attempting to take a listing. The seller tells the broker, hey, you know, I'm not a racist or anything. Now, of course, you and I both know when someone starts a sentence with, I'm not a racist, they're probably about to say something racist. You know, I'm not a racist or anything, but look, if somebody calls and wants to see the house and they happen to sound blue or purple or pink or red or whatever the ethnicity, look, just tell them the house isn't for sale or that we can't show it today. You know, I don't, I don't want to sell my house to people that are, you know, purple or red or pink or green or whatever. The question on the test might say, hey, how do you respond to that request? Seller says, don't show the property to fill in the blank. What do you do? One question, one answer choice might say, hey, you know, take the listing, but disobey them. The state's not going to want you to answer like that. The state's going to want you to answer, refuse the listing. Real estate agents should simply refuse the listing where such discrimination is attempted. So again, don't try to give them a civics lesson or whatever it is. The state's going to want you to say, just refuse the listing where such discrimination is attempted. So number one, what's the goal of fair housing? It's not to make sure that everybody pays the same rate. Number two, it's not to make sure that everybody, you know, the banks make an equal amount of loans to members of every race. Rather, the goal of fair housing is to make our industry colorblind, number one. Number two for the test, if the seller says, hey, don't show the property to fill in the blank, what do you do? Simply refuse the listing where such discrimination is attempted. Now, I want to show you one other, a couple of other things here real quick. First, there is one time when you are able to discriminate, and that's on the basis of age, A-G-E, on age and if you look here at the very top of page number four, uh, 457, you'll see two things at the top of 457. The first thing you'll see on 457 is you'll see these two black squares. And there are two ways that you could set up your adult community. There are two ways you could set up your adult community. One way you could set it up is you could have a rule that says everybody has to be at least 62. That's one rule. You could set up your community and say, like, all residents have to be at least 62. Another way you could set it up, and you'll see this in that top black square at the top of 457, you could also say 80% of the residents have to be at least 55. Now, the last thing I want to share with you on 458 is very important for the test. You'll see the term redlining at the bottom left of 458 you'll see the term redlining at the bottom of 458. And 
redlining is, I'll give you the background to this and I'll give you the question on the test. Back in the day, a long time ago, lenders would look at maps on the wall of, of communities. And back in the day, lenders would take a big red marker and draw red lines around communities. And they'd say, hey, you know, there's too many minorities that live in that area. We don't want to make loans in that area because there's too many minorities there. Minorities don't pay their bills. So we don't want to lend to minorities. That obviously is illegal. A lender cannot consider the ethnic demographic of an area in making a lending decision. So if the question on the test were to say, assume a lender refuses to make a loan in a particular community based on the ethnic composition of the community. This is known as A, blockbusting, B, steering, or C, redlining. Your answer, it's redlining. It's a refusal to lend based on race and location. Now, I'm basically done with my presentation tonight, but I want to share one more thing with you because I have a little bit of time that's, all, that's also on the test. Now, if you look here at the middle of 458, you'll see where it says discrimination in lending. And we talked about redlining, right? We know that that's illegal. A quick question for you that is also often on the state exam. You might see a question on the test about the loan application. Now, one note that you might want, well, let me ask you a question. Do you think when you apply for a real estate loan, do you think that the lender asks for your race on the loan application? Think about that. You apply for a home loan. Do you think your lender is going to ask what your ethnicity is? And in fact, if you think about this, most people would say, well, of course not. They're not going to ask for your race. They can't take your race into account when they, when they make a lending decision. And the truth is, is, and here's what's crazy about this, not only will the lender ask you for your race, they feel so strongly about needing something answered that if you refuse to tell the lender what your race is, the lender has to make a reasonable determination based on your last name and your appearance and they'll check the box. So for the state test, a lot of people would say, if I didn't tell you that just now and I asked you, hey, do you think the lender is gonna ask for your race on the loan app? You would say, of course not, they can't do that. That's totally illegal. They, they, there's a, they have no right to do that. But for the test, you might wanna write loan application, ethnicity asked, but optional. So I would write here, uh, loan application, ethnicity asked, optional for borrower to answer. And the reason is because if the bank gets audited by the government, the government wants to see, hey, who are you making loans to? And if a bank gets audited and it finds out that, for example, blue people with good credit pay more interest and more fees than you know red people with the same credit, that might be indicative of discrimination. So again, I want to be careful, I want you to be careful on the test. If the test were to ask you, is the lender going to ask for your race? Yes. Do you have to answer no, but it's on the application to prevent discrimination, right? It, it, so if, if a lender is audited, you know, they know that everything is sort of on the up and up. I do want to see uh, any questions about anything.